Ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to be together with all of you in a film that I know touches all of us, but uh, leaves us at a note of hope that we can together change the world. It is great to be here in Colosseum Kiel. For someone born in 1966, I thought that my two greatest experiences here would be Star Wars and Star Trek, respectively, in 1977. When you are 11 years old and you see Luke Skywalker, you realize, wow, that's what I want to be like. <laughs> Let me tell you this as a uh, top that experience. Um, there is something about the way in which uh, stories are being told that touch all of us. My name is Henrik Sus, I'm a former member of the Nobel Committee, and I'm very proud to be working with the Nobel Peace Center. Thank you, Kathy, for all the work you do. I think a big round of applause for the Peace Center. What the Peace Center is trying to do is to be uh, inspired by the Nobel laureates and their work for peace, which often goes through dialogue. One of the Nobel laureates that I have had the honor and pleasure of being with is Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos. And his journey started exactly with a willingness to listen. And to listen to people that his friends said you cannot speak to, because they are evil, they are bad, they are killing us. How on earth? Can you sit down at the right table, at the same table, and ask them, what sort of Colombia do you want? But he asked back, where else can we start? That's what we're going to do for the next approximately one hour and 15 minutes. We're going to have some dialogues where we explore exactly that issue. Yeah, we're talking about really big things here, some quite scary things. But we're also talking about everyday life. We're talking about human beings who look each other in the face, and in my experience, come to the point where they become friends. Isn't that the most touching aspect of this film? When you ask someone directly, do you hate me? No, I don't hate you, because you're my friend. And that's where it starts. So thank you, Dia. I'm going to be joined now by three people who are truly courageous, because they share their stories. One of them is Dia who is a Norwegian filmmaker. We are proud of being able to call you Norwegian. You know how we are, you know, when someone wins something, you know. <laughs> so it's Pia Han. She's up there with Arling Graf Korn and Martin Lødvold, I would say. <laughs> Norwegians we're proud of. You're a documentary filmmaker. You have received two Emmy Awards. You have received two PBD Awards. You are a BAFTA winner, and you have received the Royal Television Society. Award. You will not be alone up here. Please have a seat. <laughs> the strange thing about I am no hair here. <laughs> you very rarely see that. I just want to check that everything was working. Okay, I'll, I'll stand this way again. Um, the next two people whom you will meet are people you've actually seen earlier today, because you've seen them in the film. And these are two eminently brave people, because they have dared to stand up and say, A, I did something that wasn't good, and B, I want to continue to talk about this so we can learn. So it's my great pleasure to welcome up on stage Jeff Scoop and Arlo Michaels. Please. I'm really lucky I get to sit up here with you and have a dialogue with you, but all of you are included. We cannot do questions from the audience today because it's pretty big, but, you know, in spirit, we do so. 
amazing to be here. I just want to, before I start having you talk to you, I just want to uh, give you one of my uh, dialogue tips. They're not as profound as the ones you hear now. But when I was on the Nobel Committee, I was the uh, vice chair. So I'm the one accompanying the laureate into City Hall. and Everyone is kind of nervous. So I decided with my dark suit to wear happy socks. <laughs> and it's the start of a dialogue because we're kind of nervous. And everyone's wondering what's happening and where are the cameras. And I just said, you know, I'm doing happy socks. So then you It'll be okay. Um, yeah. Tell me how you feel about this film, seeing it now, several years after you made it. First of all, thank you. Thank you to the Nobel Peace Center, Shashti, Kim, Ingvil, whatever you are, and everybody else. And thank you all for being here. This is so special. Um, you know, it feels quite emotional, I have to say, to watch it again. Obviously, I've seen it a thousand times during the edit, so it's, you know, it's not new. But just watching the guys, watching their faces, and some of the stuff I was saying to my brother going, I can't believe I was there. It's, it's so surreal now uh, at a distance. Um, but what I'm the most touched by is everything that happened during the film, but then also since the film. Um, you know, where Brian, as you saw, he left in the course of making the film itself. Um, Ken, the, the man with the swastika tattoo on his chest, uh, he, so in the film, the last thing you see is that he posts that photo, he gets banned from his uh, college, and the college basically decided to hold a hearing before they made like a final decision, we're going to throw him out. I've never really sort of publicly said it before, but I think it's worth mentioning now. Um, at that point, he reached out to me and he was really angry and really worried and really nervous about what his future held. And I decided to write a letter to the committee that was having the hearing at the college. And I said, I don't know this guy very well, but I do know that he's not a school shooter. He's not gonna do what you think he's going to do. And I believe that for a young man like that, the best place, the safest place for him to be is in a place of learning. So please don't throw him out. Please consider him staying. And they didn't. And they didn't. It did not. But from then on, and Ken was really touched by that because he said, he said, you know, my white brothers didn't do that for me. And you are putting your neck, your reputation, everything on the line, vouching for somebody like me. Um, and so we ended up becoming actually quite good friends since then. And then fast forward, would it have been two years after the film was made? Um, I get a phone call. Uh, no, not a phone call. I hope you don't mind me saying this, but the last time I filmed with Jeff, uh, where you know the organization is still going to be white and you know the issues are important, but it's still white issues. Um, we packed up all our equipment and we went out and I was waiting for the Uber and he went to his car. And I ran over to him and I said, look, is, you know, thank you for being so patient because we'd spend a lot of time together by that point. And I'd annoyed him a lot and asked him all kinds of inappropriate questions. And I said, look, just thank you for being so patient. And I really appreciate it. And I know it wasn't very easy for you. And I said, is it okay, is it okay to give you a hug? And during the course of our filming, I started saying, I'm like an annoying little sister for you. Um, and he hugged me. He said, yes, yeah, okay to hug. And I hugged him. Uh, and he just quietly said, he said, and you now have a brother. He said, if you ever need anything, let me know. In that moment, I knew he's not going to last. He might, he might not leave today. He might not leave in 20 years, but he's not going to last. But I couldn't at the time when the film came out, I couldn't publicly say that uh, because it would have risked his life. So fast forward two years, I get a phone call from him. Uh, I remember sitting on a mattress in D.C. or something. Uh, and him saying, I'm out, and I don't know what to do. I feel very alone, and I don't know who else to talk to, but I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And I was so proud. I was so touched, and I was sitting there desperate to go. I knew it. I told you. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> it's not just for white people. It's for all of us. And so I'm very, very proud. I'm super proud. I mean, who would have thunk? We're going to sit here. Well, it's fantastic. Fantastic to have you with us. Uh, these are real stories. 
It's a very real film. I don't know if anyone in the audience has taken part in making this kind of film. You do spend a lot of time together. Yeah. It takes time for every minute that you actually see here, you spend time together. Before I move on to Jeff and Arno, I thought I'd ask you, were you expecting or beforehand any sort of change in the people you were interviewing? What were your expectations when you started doing this? My, my expectations were very minimal. If, if you would have said to me a few years ago, Dia, you're going to be sitting on a couch with this guy, you're going to become friends, you're going to become friends with some guy with a, you know, t a swastika tattooed on his chest, I wouldn't just laugh at you, I would be offended, I would feel insulted that you think I can be friends with people like that. Like, that's, that's what, how I would have reacted. My, expect, my purpose for making the film was, first of all, it was personal. It was trying to liberate myself from the fear I have from people like this. I've been afraid of guys like this since I was little. So I wanted to make an active choice no longer to be afraid. The second thing was, what I wondered was, is it possible for somebody like me to sit with somebody like that and for him to see my humanity and for me to recognize his? Is that possible? That was all I wanted to do and to try and understand is there anything else behind the slogans? So did I expect any of this would happen? Absolutely not. That's why this is very emotional. Like, you know, people keep going, some people have asked me, they're like, well, but you must have tried a little bit. And I was going, no, I thought they were lost causes. Like, I, I, I didn't think this is doable. One word that keeps coming back in any of the conversations in the film, and I guess in our hearts is the word fear. We are afraid of something. We fear each other. Maybe we fear ourselves. I think we fear ourselves. Yeah? Yeah. That, that, that's part of it. Jeff, when you see this film now, once again, to both of you, amazing to have you with us to talk about this. How do you feel when you, when you see yourself? And I'm not, you know, after any sort of self-criticism. I'm just wondering, as, a, as an audi part of the audience, how do you feel about seeing this? It's really difficult to, to look at. It's, it's um, once you've left that life, it's like looking back. It's like seeing someone else. Yeah. Obviously, I know it's, it's me, but it's like looking back at someone else and, and wondering, how did, you, how did you get there? How did I get to that point? And, and coming through it. And it's about dialogue. It yeah. really is. Truly yeah. is. Yeah. Because once you start this dialogue with others who ask you questions, where you realize, ah, that was kind of uncomfortable. You hopefully also start a dialogue with yourself. Uh, there are times here when both you and others get quiet because, wow, how on earth am I going to answer that question? This happens to me every day. <laughs> <laughs> and then you start conversing with yourself. Would you, would you say that that's part of the process that you've been through? Absolutely. And, and you can see in the film where Dia's asking me, questions and she's challenging me and she i saw her humanity and that is something that i that i was missing i was not able to see the humanity and the people that i had othered and dehumanized for years and years and years and getting to know dia over the course of the film it changed my life yeah. because you can see it in the film in in my eyes and if you look at the eyes of ken and some of the other individuals in the film you can see it too yeah. if you look closely you can see it when she's saying that made how that made me feel hmm. and the way the best way i can explain that is it was so emotional i was i internalized it but it felt like getting kicked in the chest by a horse because i felt i, I could not just see her pain i could feel it yeah. like a vibe or an energy in the air and it really hurt hmm. it, it was really hmm. um it really hurt and that was the beginning of the end for me yeah and of it course, changed my life yeah I guess it's part of it, being able to share the pain. I mean, I've been on some school trips with school kids to the Nazi concentration camps of the 1940s. And it's a very, very strong experience because you feel that this could have been me. I could have been the one being uh, targeted. And I guess that's part of what happens to this movement of empathy, where you suddenly realize, what if I had been the one being told that you don't belong because you are this or that or the other? Arno, wonderful that you're here too. You've spent quite a lot of time talking about these things. You are an educator, you are an author, you have really put 
these questions on the map with your background. Let me say first that I'm sure you're a pretty good musician, even though the lyrics are crap. <laughs> You look, you look cool. Anyway, I'm, I'm not taking the I message. Know, I can walk the walk, but I can't sing the song. That's yeah. the thing. I, I don't have a lick of musical talent and never did, but uh. I can scream really loud. I was good at that. That's part of music, too. <laughs> scream really loud. Or that kind of music at work. <laughs> How do you feel about seeing the film? Because your vantage point is different since you've been, for many years, part of the movement, talking about forgiveness and dialogue. And nonetheless, it's yourself in the past that you see here. How do you feel about that? Um, well, there's one uh, since then side note that we did not mention. Um, if you guys remember Ken vehemently saying, what did he say? Yeah. I will never break bread with a Jew. Um, if, uh, in addition to being an author, I'm inspired very much by Dia. I'm a fake it till you make it filmmaker. And if you go to YouTube and, Google and look for Gift of Our Wounds, you'll find our YouTube channel. And on that channel, you can find Ken on video breaking bread with a Jewish woman. <laughs> and not only does he break bread with her, but he, he apologizes in a very heartfelt way and asks for her forgiveness. And the woman is a friend of mine named Tamara Meyer, who was part of the kinder transport program. Um, her parents were. And so to have someone with, who was personally affected by the Holocaust in that way, to be able to sit down with Ken, and all credit to Ken for, for doing that. Um, he really put himself out there and made himself vulnerable. Uh, super proud of him for that. Um, otherwise, when I watched the film, before Jeff got out, I knew who Jeff was. He knew who I was back in the day. Yeah. And before Jeff got out, I saw the film, and you're right, you saw Dia's of humanity, but in the film, when you're like squirming there, we're seeing your humanity also. Yeah. And I think that that's part of, that's something that gets lost, is when you're, in the, when you're in the movement, when you're consumed by hatred, you're diminishing your own humanity as well as others, and you're disconnecting yourself from it. So uh, Dia did such an amazing job to introduce Jeff to his own humanity, through her humanity, and uh, I think it's just such a special film. I'm, I'm so honored to be here today with my friends and, and uh, to take part with this film again. Oh, wonderful. And you heard the expression you used, friends? You know, to meet like friends like this. I love the fact that you um, take as your point of departure the breaking the bread scene. Yeah. Which I think many of us is one of the strongest parts of the film. Yeah. Because just using that expression brings us back into one of the basic tenets of any good society. A society where you can have a meal together. That's where you can actually do these things that are about sharing. Sharing the things that are good. I mean, if you go back to Plato and ancient Greek philosophy, we'll say that in a good city-state, we eat together. Or, you know, the story of the Last Supper is essentially about when things are tough, we eat together. And I think it's wonderful to share that story, that they actually broke bread. Dia, yeah, can you tell us a bit more about some of the other people that we see in the film? Because there are some who haven't changed their minds, who are still part of this. Um, so what's the difference between those who um, decide to break with such a violent, hateful movement, and those who believe that it's still right to be part of it? Well, I think, you know, I think different people join for different reasons. And I think for different people, the, the movement satisfies different sort of human needs that they have. Like, for example, you, you I'm sure noticed there was a difference. I call them like the suit and tie racists, uh, the kind of the, the rich guys, basically, and, and the more working class guys like, like Jeff and his group. And, you know, what, what was really interesting to me with Richard Spencer is his name was, I don't need him to say racist things to confirm that he's a racist. What I thought was really telling and interesting was, also, was this class divide within the white supremacist movement. So his contempt for me, you expect, you, you sort of understand that, but his contempt for other white people, I thought was really, really fascinating. And he, uh, he was one of the people actually who never sp was alone. I constantly kept asking, can we go to a different room? Can we go talk? Can we do an interview now? And he, and he always, always kept an audience. audience. He would always, always have his guys around him. 
Um, so we never really actually got to talk. It was, we never got to, with these guys, we got to eventually get past the slogans and the talking points. With Richard, that was just never possible. Um, and also, I think, you know, like Jared Taylor and some of the other guys, I think they're, they're, not, they're not just emotionally driven, they're ideologically driven, and they're looking for a certain level of influence and power within the political space as well, you know. One of the basic things that is said in this book, inspired by Nobel laureates, is that dialogue starts with, or alternatively produces an attitude. So you have to be willing to enter into dialogue. May I ask you, and I'll start with you, Jeff, why did you say yes initially to talking to Dia at all? You could have said, eh, why on earth should I be on film? And I'm sure you said no a few times before you said yes. But can you tell me the story about how you moved from no to yes? Well, you're the hard person to say no to. But she's very persistent. Um, that's why I, I said she was like a bratty little sister. Um, but uh, originally, my, uh, the reason I agreed to be in the film was I saw being in documentaries and things like that at the time uh, in the movement as an opportunity to spew the propaganda and to get out the message. So I had originally had said to, to Dia, I said, you've got 30 minutes of my time and that's it. That's it, we're done after 30 minutes. Several hours later, this is on the first meeting. Five hours. Several, yeah, five, was it five? It was over five. Five <laughs> hours later, <laughs> she said, she says, Jeff, what happened to that 30 minutes? <laughs> you know, and I said, I don't know. Uh, uh, um, what you're very, the questions you're asking are very intriguing. Yeah. They're very uh, interesting. And uh, there was something, it was that humanistic connection. I could, I could tell that she wasn't your typical journalist. She wasn't somebody that was just there for a job to uh, you know, get answers and, and to, to poke and things like that. She I truly wanted to understand how did someone get to this point? And for whatever reason, that, that uh, spoke to me. And it, when I was able to see her humanity, it, change, it, it changed everything. Yeah. So what you are saying also is that a key part of the relationship that was built between you was built on the fact that she was also interested in you. She was not just interested in the movement or in some political event, but she was actually interested in you. I think a lot of people, when they engage with people like this, typically, uh, there's a tendency to not listen. There's a tendency of, I'm going to make my points. I'm going to get to say all the anti-racist stuff. You're going to get to say all your Nazi stuff. And then we're both going to pat ourselves on the back for having the, I'll pat myself on the back for having the correct opinions and the correct politics and the correct everything. And we can both go off having been right and being self-righteous in our own sort of thing. And we both win. And I think what him and other guys weren't used to was, okay, you're finished. You, like, I'm letting you finish your thing. And now let's really start talking. And wanting to stay, uh, I think was important rather than just condemning and going off in a huff. I, I, I didn't want to make a film to capture what Nazis and racists say. Mm -hmm. To me, that's boring. I already know that. I want to know why. I know what you have done also makes a big impression because once again you could have just left this part of your life behind you know changed your name gotten into a new band <laughs> but you decided at some point that this is something i need to talk about talk to others talk to people like dia write be a filmmaker yourself how did that decision come about it was really an act of self-preservation so when I left the movement, uh, being a man of extremes, I went from being a neo-Nazi skinhead to being a raver. And so here I am a couple years out from beating up people because of the color of their skin, shaking my ass to house music at four in the morning on Sunday in the south side of Chicago, surrounded by 3,000 people of every possible ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic background you can imagine, and loving every minute of it. Um, very formulative time of my life. It, it was very uh, healing, but I was also still self-medicating. I was still drinking very heavily. I was doing every drug known to humankind. I quit drinking in 2004. 2006, 
I fell madly in love with this woman who dumped me for the guy who owned the Range Rover dealership. And I was, I was heartbroken by that. And it kind of sent me into this year-long suicidal depression that I realized very quickly wasn't about her. And it wasn't about that heartbreak in particular. It was about my past. It was, it was that I had never faced my past and I had never reconciled the harm that I had done. And so that's when it dawned on me I needed to do something about that. That's when I started writing uh, the, the early formation of my first book, My Life After Hate Happened Then. I went public with the story on uh, the MLK holiday of 2010, inspired by Dr. King's speech, uh, Time to Break the Silence. And I, I did it with the intention of letting people know that people who got involved in neo-Nazi groups were, like Jeff points out very often, they, they thought they were doing something good. They, they, they thought they were doing the right thing. And, and that they, they were, while they had made horrible mistakes, they were still human beings. And that compassion was what could reach them and turn them around rather than further rejection. Um, but I, I got to that point because it was really like, I got to talk about my past or it's going to consume me. And once I started talking about my past, so I was very fortunate to meet amazing people like Dia and, and later Jeff. Um, and, and so many people, Party being an amazing example, uh, Party has told me that I've been a part of his healing process. And I can't ask for a greater gift than that um, to, to help someone who has been so horrifically affected by hatred to lose a loved one in a mass murder and to have your community attacked in your place of worship, um, to be of service to him, to be a service to the, the global sick community, such a call, brother. Um, that's, been, that's been an amazing thing for me as well. Makes a huge impression in so many ways, because it's also directly related to our main theme today about dialogue. Because it seems this started with a dialogue that you had to have with yourself. Absolutely. And that's painful, because when you have a dialogue with yourself, it's harder to lie because you know yourself. Well, I mean, we can fool ourselves <laughs> and trick ourselves into some kind of image or make excuses. But at some point, you come to this place where you want to be honest, and thus leave things behind, which leads to another part of dialogue, which is forgiveness. Is it possible to forgive someone who has hated you, who has tried to destroy who you are? Now, that's not true for the three of you sitting there, because you have actually had very peaceful dialogues, but you have met people in your life who have been directly hateful towards you. Others have experienced things that are even more dramatic. Maybe people trying to take their lives or kill someone in their family. Can we get to the points of reconciliation? And if so, how do we do that? Yes, it is for all of you, but right now for you. I think, I guess the best way I can describe it is many of my friends have asked me, and especially after making this film, they keep and, and subsequent films as well, they keep going, why do you keep filming these horrible guys? Why do you keep sitting with all these incredibly hateful, violent people? Are you trying to rescue their humanity? And my answer to that is no. Actually, that's completely the, the wrong way around of looking at it. I'm trying to rescue my own. I'm trying to hold on to my own humanity is actually what it's about. And I think when we say that we stand for certain values, we stand for certain principles, if we're not able to live by them when you're sitting opposite from a person who you dislike, who you disagree with and are very, very different from, then it's no good me extending human rights and dignity and all of this to you because I like you and we agree. It matters to hold on to people's dignity and their humanity when they themselves think, and maybe I also think that maybe they don't deserve it, but that's when your principles matter. 
So, so I, can't I can't answer the question, question of forgiveness. forgiveness. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's up to different people's yeah. journeys. But I can say that just in terms of how to meet these types of movements or people who we vehemently disagree with, it's not about them in many ways. It's about ourselves and who we choose to be in life. So recognition of your own humanity yes. results in this. Yes. There are some people that those of us who have worked on or with the Nobel Peace Prize often say they should have received it. Gandhi is an obvious one. But another one who's always inspired me and she should have received it is Eleanor Roosevelt, yeah. who led the committee that wrote the draft for the Universal Declaration. One of the things that she insisted on was that this declaration needed a very good opening. And what's the opening? It's inherent dignity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's this recognition that it's not because of what you've done or who you are that you have dignity because that was the whole Nazi message that you don't belong because you're not the right kind. No, dignity is inherent in being a human being. And the start of getting to... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think there's something about me and microphones. Yes. <laughs> but uh, so, so, so how do you feel about that term from Eleanor Roosevelt and her committee, inherent dignity? To me, dignity is one of the most important words that I live by, that I work by. Most of the, the, the pain and the violence and the violent behaviors that I've come across in all the films that I've made with so very many violent people, at the root of it, there is trauma and there is humiliation. And the antidote I have found to humiliation is always dignity. So it was crucial for me when engaging with him, when engaging with other guys in, in the film and others that didn't make it into the film, was I am not going to allow for them to set the table of how this conversation is going to go. I'm not gonna allow them to throw me off balance. There are no words he can say to me that will move me off what I'm trying to do. And I refused to take dignity away from my interaction with him. No matter what he's going to say to me, I always kept that front and center. And it was very difficult at times. I'm not going to lie. I'm not like, you know, Buddha or something. <laughs> I lose it. I've, I've been close to punching people. So I'm, you know, it, it doesn't always work. But, but that I try and I strive to keep dignity there, no matter what. So there's a mutual recognition of dignity. I think we see that between you right now, here. Um, which, of course, also creates a sense of optimism. And I'll try to land our little conversation here. Thanks again for taking part. It makes a really big impression about where we go from here. Because over the last few months, even years, there has been talk about the possibility of things getting worse. In your country, the United States of America, there has been talk of the possibility of a new civil war. The others say that no, in the end, if we manage to hold on to such values as dignity and dialogue, common sense will prevail. We don't need to have a civil war because we can live together. Arno, let me ask you, you don't need to come with any big political statement of any kind here or talk about the midterms or whatever. But the way you see it, can we stave off? Can we avoid that sort of situation where you end up in a new civil war? Do you see hopeful signs? I'm absolutely hopeful, and I, I think the simple key is to get off our screens for a minute and, and talk to each other face to face. Um, I did that in the summer of 2020. I deleted my Twitter account. I just made a shell of my Facebook account. Um, I still do Instagram. If you want to hit me there, it's Arnold Michaelis. But uh, I, I find the, the less time I spend on that screen and the more time I, I spend in face-to-face -face interaction with people that it doesn't necessarily, I, I don't, the first thing I learned about it isn't about who they voted for or who they didn't or what their stance on this or that issue is. I, the first thing I learned about them is how they treat people. And so if, if I think if we can focus on that, uh, we have a foundation to work from and, and I'm in the spirit of Chardikala, which means relentless optimism, uh, I'm, I'm relentlessly optimistic. Wow, isn't that a fantastic term? Relentlessly optimistic. <laughs> Thank you, Arno. Wow. Talking about uh, Twitter, Elon Musk may now help us get rid of the whole thing. So that's, uh, but that's, that's another film there for you. Uh, 
Jeff, let me ask some of the same kind of question to you. Answer it in whatever way you like. But where do you see optimism ahead for actually being able to create this sort of listening, biologic society that we need so urgently? I think we're, we're having it right here today. This is all about dialogue, the Nobel Center and, and uh, the work that all of us up here are doing, um, creating that dialogue, creating those conversations, um, letting people speak and letting them be heard, and also listening. We need to listen more in society and, and listen to the other side. And even we don't have to all agree. How, how boring would the world be if we all agreed on everything? If, if the world was a, a, was a field of sunflowers, or would we rather look out at a field full of wildflowers where they were all different? Both are beautiful, but the wildflowers are, are, what, are the way that I see the world. And we're all different. And uh, we can disagree on things, and that's OK. But uh, the, the polarization that we're experiencing in the United States, especially right now, is, is uh, at, at a really uh, dangerous level. And we have to bring back dialogue. So some of the good work that you all are doing here in, in Norway, uh, we need more of that in the United States. And we need you. Um, thank you. I'm sure you all agree with me that this sort of conversation uh, makes a deep impression. Um, I'm a philosopher by background. Many people wonder what a philosopher actually does. <laughs> we think. <laughs> I, I was once threatened by my labor union to be called out into a strike, and I was wondering, what does a philosopher on strike do? <laughs> um, but jokes aside, um, in our tradition, and you find this actually very parallel in both Christian, Jewish, and Muslim traditions, because they've been all influenced by Greek philosophy, but you find it in other traditions as well. We often talk about certain virtues, and in our tradition, we often talk about four cardinal virtues, the most important ones, and I find that you represent so much of that. Number one is moderation. That's being able to hold back the anger. Yes, we can disagree, but to hold back and listen and give space to the other. Number two is courage. And you show immense amounts of courage. Not necessarily because what you say will be threatening to others, although I'm sure it can be, and it can be dangerous in that way too, but because you reveal yourself. So that's the greatest sort of courage, isn't it? Yeah. Then there is wisdom or prudence, which essentially is about listening to the other as well, <laughs> because that's how we grow. And according to Plato, when those three work well together, you have the fourth virtue, which is justice a just society where we see each other, appreciate each other, give space for each other. So DA, you will sit up a bit longer, but I think that the rest of us will all just stand up and give a big round of applause to Jeff. Jeff, this almost feels like a Nobel ceremony, doesn't it? A bit like being in City Hall. So thank you all for being here and making this so special. We will have one more round of dialogue, and we'll have that with two of my favorite people. Shro uh, Boram, you worked at the Nobel Peace Center, several other places as well, but you are their um, advisor, or as Chef likes to say, expert <laughs> on the dialogue. You formerly worked at Nansen Ted Center on various sorts of educational programs dealing with dialogue. And you have led dialogue processes, among other places, uh, uh, in the Middle East and, and also here in, in Europe. And you are a senior facilitator for Alternative to Violence International and work for many other organizations. So here you are with us. And you won't be alone up here with you because we also have one of uh, my favorite Norwegian voices, also someone I'm fortunate to call a friend, uh, Finn Svodru, who is one of Norway's leading psychiatrists. Many of you will know him from his books or his lectures. And he was also the founder of a wonderful uh, institution called Bidasu, working on issues having to do with eating disorders. Um, but you also deal generally with the worry we all have within us, that things are not as good as they should be. But once we face that, maybe we can do something about it. So please give a big round of applause to Chok and to Finn. So now we actually have three Norwegians here. I'd like to take Norway as my point of departure because we heard here, and it's very generous the way Jeff and Arno 
express admiration for Norway, you know, we're doing this sort of thing. But we Norwegians can sometimes have this tendency to say, oh, everything is good in Norway. You know, everyone will have a visa to it, visa to it. <laughs> and um, we have our challenges as well. But it does seem that Norway is less polarized than many other countries. Let me start with you, Finn. Do uh, you think that is true? And if so, why is Norway seemingly a relatively peaceful biologic society? Yes, we are less polarized, but uh, it's not necessarily this in the future, because uh, we know where well economical differences create polarization. And I was very happy for Arno and this uh, about the communication technology because dialogue, uh, our nerve systems are created for being in the same room. It's created for face to face. Uh, it's created for looking into the other's eyes. Um, so I'm a bit worried. I like your optimism, uh, Henrik, but a bit worried about uh, the ways we communicate through the screens. It's a big, big topic indeed. Sure, you, we often call you a specialist or expert on dialogue. One thing we haven't touched on so far today is what is dialogue? Can you tell me or us what dialogue is at its best or worst? So I, I think I had the privilege and honor to learn from really eminent people that work with a lot with uh, forgiveness and reconciliation. And from there, I entered actually dialogue. But um, being told as an expert, I think I had the privilege to also teach it and learn. But uh, seriously, you can be an expert without being dialogical, you know. So. An everyday conversation, and I just want to say why I say this, that you can be an expert without being a dialogical person. An everyday conversation, we call dialogue for a, like a small talk. It can be an everyday conversation, but that is a, for me a little bit too easy. Because some people, they invite you to dialogue, but it's actually a debate even. It can be a political uh, rhetorical point and throwing ping points and everything. For me, that's not a dialogue, but they invite you for dialogue. So they overuse it in a wrong way. And thereby, if you get a bad experience in what they call dialogue, you will not trust the dialogue because you say, well, I experienced dialogue, it was not good. So it's a method of communication. It's a process. It's a way to manage conflicts, but it's also a way to engage, to find sustainable solutions to really complicated um, problems. When I met Shaxi, the director, at one point she said, Chiro, okay, coming from a, a, like your professional field is more reconciliation and forgiveness, like, but we have started to um, study the peace laureates, the peace prize laureates, and we see that the red thread is dialogue. And I was like, really? How is that? And she asked me, like, can you just look upon their story and see if we can find anything to that. And um, it was act actually quite true. It was the red thread. And what is very interesting, but they did it all differently. And we look upon them as supermodels that they made really big changes on societal level. But they all have different kind of entry points to do this. They all have different kind of principles that they hang on to. And I think that's why I don't like to be the dialogue expert, because if I think about dialogue, it would be such a big idol that it's a little bit difficult to achieve. But even the, the Peace Prize laureates, they didn't like do it like fully. They, all of them, they had one, maybe two principle that they didn't give up on. And that's why they managed to make maybe use uh, use this as an entry point. So when you have to buy the book to get to know all of the eight principles. <laughs> but uh, this uh, today, we have uh, actually what you said previously, the subject about today, uh, it's on the first um, uh, what do you call principle. And it's the first, but also the last one dialogue as a basic attitude, as an attitude to life. And this is what I say, the dialogical. It's about the ability and will 
and you also address the willingness to 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 be take part in a dialogue but it's also about the will to intentionally go into a conversation or oh, sorry dialogue to go into a dialogue with deep respect with openness curiosity and always think upon the other person equal to yourself or even more than yourself that of course brings us directly to listening because in order to learn from the other, in order to be curious, you have to listen. I have a friend who used to be a politician, and I always liked it when he was on the radio for the Norwegian morning uh, political show called Politis Parquet, because he always seemed to be listening to the other and give the other some points. And say, you oh, know, that was interesting. I, I, I way too rarely hear that. And he replied to me, well, you see, I have small kids, so I never have time to prepare. <laughs> So I come into the studio wondering, what are we talking about today? Maybe sometimes you over-prepare because we are so adamant that we want others to listen to my point. So we forget to listen to the others. Uh, yeah, in the film, you have, of course, been open to listening to these people. But after all, the film is about what most of us would say and not least Jeff and Arno would say, are quite extreme attitudes. What's the learning that we can take from a film such as yours and your process into our everyday lives, into the meetings we have every day, the quarrel we have with a spouse or a neighbor? Are there learning points from what you have been through? I think so. I mean, just to continue on a little bit on, on the, to me, the purpose of dialogue is connection human connection, um, and I think understanding. In, in the space of dialogue, we begin to understand each other. And I think one of the biggest things that we struggle with as, as human beings in any part of life, in any sphere of society, we struggle to manage differences. And I think that is obviously very extreme differences when it comes to the film, but I think differences with our partners, with our family members, with our kids, with our colleagues. I think dialogue is one of the only tools that we have to try and bridge that and to try to locate common ground, to try to locate where the space of imagination and something else can come to be. So I think you know, the way that I speak with Jeff or listen to Jeff is, and I mean this completely respectfully actually, is the same way that I listen to my four-year-old child. I, I mean, it, it sounds like an insight, it's, it's not. It's with complete attention and complete focus and interest in what she has to say. So I think the principles of dialogue, the principles of listening, the principles of not judging, the principles of trying to leave my own baggage at the door and trying to focus on the person who's in front of me and trying not just to hear the words that they are saying, because I'm always reading people's faces and I'm always trying to listen to what is it that the silence is also telling me, not just the words. What is it that their expressions are telling me and what is it behind what they're saying. And I think once I get to that, and that's just as true for my colleagues that I work with, who sometimes struggle with certain things, or my friends or my family members, you're trying to get to, but what is it really? So you listen in many different ways. I listen in many different ways, and I try to be as attentive as I can be. To people. Um, so I think the principles of dialogue are very, very transferable from extremists to everyday life. <laughs> I want my microphone back. Just thank you, thank you, dear. That makes, makes so much sense. And that, of course, brings us over to you, Finn, who has so much experience of sitting in rooms, having dialogue about things that are really difficult. Maybe things we don't want to talk about. That's, of course, one of the things that makes such a huge impression when it comes to Jeff and Arno and others in the film. You are willing to actually talk about it. But a lot of the time you talk to people who need to be in dialogue, but they don't want to talk about it. How do we get the ball rolling? How do we start a conversation about something that's really difficult? I think the way to start is uh, to try to behave like Henrik Sysser. And that's uh, making a safe room, 
uh, where playfulness, humor, uh, but there's a clear intention that this room should be said in love. And as a medical practice, psychotherapy, I mean, there are written uh, lots of articles about the angle of the chairs, so we don't have to look into the eyes all the time about um, 42 degrees is very good. <laughs> or with uh, children or teenagers, we, we very often they lack the language. It can be very good to have a walk in the park and, and a, in addition. I'm not doing anything. No. So I think it's also technology in a way, a human technology. But I think the most important part, Henrik, is uh, that it's an act of will. I mean, you do want to do it. It's a, like we talk about love today, it's important to be seen, I need love. Yes, but loving is also an act of will that I really want to be interested in you. And since you're talking about psychiatry, the dilemma is when do we ourselves lose curiosity? We lose curiosity if we are stressed, if it's fair, it's a lot of shame, low self-esteem. So we lose it, so we have to work to keep the curiosity up in a way. Do you find that if you are very sincere, like you're saying, if you're very sincere in your intention to want to sit with somebody and to allow them to take the time that they need to take, but the word caring, the fact that you care about the person that you're sitting across from, do you find that that helps? Because I, I think in all the work that I do, I think that's one of the, the, the keys in a way that, that finally gets you through all the barriers is the other person feeling like she does actually care. She actually wants to know. And the person feels like they matter and that they're being seen and not just heard. But that feeling, do you, does that apply in how you do it? Definitely. We say that, particularly working with young people, you should sit at the end of the chair. So you should really so that you're closer. Yeah, show that you're yeah. interested in. And you have to mean it. I mean, if you're going to be authentic, warm and engaged, you have to mean it. Yeah. And you have to like the person in a way. And sometimes we meet persons that are not that easy to like. Yeah. So we can like them because nobody else likes them. It's a way to try to do it, yes. Yeah. Mm. But it's... what if they do this? If you're sitting, if you do, if you lean, lean in and they do this, what do you do? Well, if they entered my office, uh, somebody has pushed them in a way and uh, most people are so polite that uh, they keep for the 45 minutes, yes. <laughs> politeness, captive, captive voice. politeness normally gets you a long way, doesn't it? It was strange for me sitting here now listening to Finn saying that you should lean forward and I sit like this. But that's because they told me that if I sit like this, all my face will be dark, so it's because of the cameras. So I just obey orders when I, when I do that. Uh, thank you very much for enlightening us on, on exactly that safe space, which is a good starting point. So you have this feeling that we want to be in the same room together, even if it's really, really difficult what we're talking about. In this fine book, you use examples from Nobel laureates. There is a separate chapter on creating the safe rooms. But let's go back to the starting point, you know, this attitude that we should have. And you use the Dalai Lama as an example, what can we learn from someone like the now 87-year-old 14th Dalai Lama? Sure. There are so many things we can learn from him, but I think like for me, I'm not a Dalai Lama expert, but are two things that I, I watched a movie uh, with a great, which is called Joy. And it's uh, a conversation and a life trip between Desmond Tutu and Dalai Lama. And those two together, they are like fantastic. Fantastic, and it's like such an inspiration. But two things that I took from this conversation, from this film, is that one part is stress. Like we have a lot of stress in Norway. We we are talking about uh, that we are not polarized and stuff like that. But to actually to be engaged in dialogue, it means that you should create a safe space. It means to have the time. It means to to stress down. It means to have a pulse that is actually not so like this. And I, when I get like this, you know, I'm like this in my everyday life because I want to achieve stuff. 
I want to get to my appointments. And lately I find myself always being late because I want to be part of everything. And I have disliked myself for that actually lately. And I said, I don't want to do that. So I tell my colleagues now, I'm not going to be late anymore, but I'm not going to be present in every meeting because I want to be present. That's what I'm going to do. So I've started trying to achieve everything and being in every meeting. That's one thing. And I think that's very important to take in. A, yeah, we, we can't be part of modernized life, multitasking and being a mother and being a father and doing everything. It's not possible. So it goes back a little bit to what you said, Finn. Secondly, also, it's about just being yourself and, be, and have the humor, even in very serious situations. Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, what they said is like, laugh, joy, love, care. You can also feel the hate, but accept that and then get over it, you know? So dialogue for me, it's also a tool to help yourself to get over that and reconcile. So I think that because Jeff and Arno also engaged so much in dialogue, it helped them to reconcile. And we all have something we have to reconcile with. So this is what I take from Dalai Lama a lot. Being yourself, being humble, being just pre and present, not at least. Mm -hmm. And then getting over it, actually, because yeah. get yeah. over it. It's not get just over. so hard, you know. Mm -hmm. It is hard in periods, but then you get over it. That leads to a question I'm sure many of us have, and I would like to hear your views on that thing, because we're talking about things that are difficult. And sometimes we don't succeed. We don't manage to get that sort of dialogue. She's trying to say something about your microphone, by the way. Yeah, it turns out that we have made a mistake. We had these in our back pockets. It's not comfortable, but it's practical. But it turns out that it makes them go boom. So I've learned something new today. Keep them in your lap. Um, but what Schroeder said was that we should also try to relax, accept that we cannot do everything, and sometimes maybe lower our ambitions. Can we do both? Can we both have these great aspirations and ambitions to create better dialogue, but at the same time admit that it's impossible to do everything? Yes, and of course, you have to see the aspect of time. Uh, it's the very famous uh, story about Thousand and One Night, uh, where he was traumatized by uh, infidelity, and she told one fairy tale every night. And that means uh, therapy for depression, like Thousand and One Night is, takes three years. <laughs> we have to accept in a way that. Uh... As a psychiatrist, the best idea of a session is that the other person wants to come back to the next session. So keep the contact. Yeah. But accept that things take time. Okay. I, yeah. I was going to add to that. I actually remember the one, my, one of my previous colleagues actually called dialogue uh, for a slow conversation. Mm. And this, I think, is a very good uh, yeah, way to think about it. You can't talk too fast. You have to keep it simple and very low. That is, of course, true. When you look at many of the Nobel Peace Prize laureates, they have actually worked on this for decades. One of my inspirations is John Hume, who received the Nobel Peace Prize for his work on the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And I saw a great documentary film about John Hume some years ago, which showed that this work started in the mid-1960s as a young man, when he realized, I can do this. But I have to talk to a lot of people, and it takes a lot of time. So let us go back to your film. Let me ask you a question that, of course, is hard to, to answer. But some of the people you talked about, not least the suit and tie people who are seemingly diehard racists, mm. do you think they are also in the process, or do you think it's possible to abide the time and think, yes, it is possible to turn people around? I, I think... Uh, I think I think the possibility of some kind of transformation is always there. So I, d I don't think that that can be 
put aside entirely. But I think we also have to be realistic. Uh, you know, not every person's going to change or have a change of heart. And I, I want to go back, if you don't mind, to the polarization point, because I think it's really important. And I wouldn't want to leave today saying that Norway is not polarized. I think that it is. It might not be to the same loud volume as America, uh, but I, I think polarization is spreading like wildfire and like an infection across most of Europe. And I think that uh, w that is why we actually need to have more conversation and we need to have more dialogue that is uncomfortable and that is um, difficult to have, I don't think that we hear each other across divides in our society. All you have to do is look at the, the, the comment sections in some newspaper articles about refugees or immigration. You know, we have Breivik, we have, we have a lot of things that are simmering just underneath the surface. And I think all of those conversations that are unpleasant and are uncomfortable, we need to have. And I think part of the reason why populist politicians are succeeding as much as they are in, in a lot of parts of the world is because we've handed over the dialogue to the farther right side of, of the political spectrum rather than because we're too afraid of having those uncomfortable uh, dialogues. So I think we need to make it okay to ask questions. I think we need to make it okay to have difficult conversations and to speak about the topics that makes us make us extra Mm, don't really want to do this, but we have to. There's no, the thing is we have to coexist. It's wonderful that Jeff has had the, the, the experience that he's had. But the reality is there's a lot of people that feel like him. And just, just because the midterms in America or, or, you know, circumstances here are the way that they are, doesn't mean that there aren't huge parts of the population that don't feel like that and various degrees of it. And the only way we're going to deal with it is we have to talk about it and we have to make it okay to talk, I think. So your original question was something else, but I just didn't want to leave the, the best, kind of... The best answers often come from different <laughs> Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leah. May I ask one follow-up question? Yes, please. <laughs> May I ask one follow-up question, since you know the UK scene quite well? And we now have a UK Prime Minister of Hindu-Indian background. Do you see some hope in that fact in a country where this has been a very hot issue? Or is that just, just, just some icing on the cake? I'm not uh, wanting you to give a full analysis of UK politics, but still it's an interesting fact, isn't it? It is an interesting fact, but he's not chosen by... The, the majority of the population. I mean, he's chosen by the system. So, so you know, once he's chosen by the, the you know, through a general election, I think that would be far more telling. Um, but of course, it's, it's always wonderful to see people of diverse backgrounds taking space in, in powerful positions. Um, but no, I, 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 I don't feel particularly hopeful because I think, you know, the premise of uh, Brexit was deeply problematic and goes back to what I was saying earlier is I think one of our biggest challenges now is we have to figure out how to deal with our differences. We have to figure out how are we going to coexist and live together in spite of not in spite, with our differences, and still find common ground, still find values that we can all sort of hold on to, whether it's dignity, whether it's equality, whether it's rights uh, and justice, or just our humanness. Maybe, maybe our common values, I sometimes think, maybe it's just that we are all broken in various ways. We all struggle in various ways. We're all in pain in different ways and we're all trying our best to figure it out. And we fail miserably and then we get up and we try again. So maybe maybe our humanness is where we start from and then start dealing with the differences. But first we have to get to what we share and we're not doing that. And we don't, and we don't have a politics of solidarity and of caring and of humanness. We have a politics that is you know, urban versus rural, you know, white versus black. I mean, it's, it's just, it's too much and it's exhausting. And, and it's why when you, you know, Shashti, you talked about dialogue, I was going, this is, this is the only way forward that I can see. And it's also the most fruitful way. 
I think of engaging with some very, very painful issues that we have to look at. I, I forgot your original question again. <laughs> that's, that's the way proper dialogue should be. It should also introduce some surprises along the way. We have two minutes left, so I'll try to land us safely. By going back to a Gallup poll that you have referred to in your work on dialogue at the Nobel Peace Center, which shows that as many as 46%, almost half of us, have lost touch with loved ones, people we want to be in touch with, due to poor dialogue. You ask people, why did you lose touch with this person that you wanted to be in touch with? They say, well, dialogue broke down. So this is not only about issues of political extremism, or war, it's about our everyday lives. And to add to that, there's a lot of pain there. Many of us feel, feel a lot of pain. We share that, or if we share that pain, maybe it's easier. Uh, so what do you read out of that for our everyday lives uh, when it comes to dialogue? Is this sort of project that the Nobel Peace Center so nobly started, do you think it can make a difference? Uh, yes, well, we have a little bit different kind of strategies, like in my head, I don't, like, and, and when we talk about it internally in Nobel, we are like, how do, can we approach as many as possible? Just for a week ago or something, I think we approached 8 billion people on, on Earth, right? So if we take the first principle, that is dialogue is an attitude. And I would say it starts with you and it ends with you. The theme of today is how can better dialogue change you? But are we talking about you, like in you or yourself? So I would say if we all, 8 billion of us, start with you, ourselves, then we can make the great change that we want to see in overall. Because I don't think we can pinpoint on everybody else and, and blame them and say that they are responsible for this. No, you are responsible of taking actions. And of course, that's what we heard today. <laughs> From uh, Jeff and Arno, who have truly started with themselves and that's that can be a painful journey but goodness how wonderful it can be as well um and jeff of course said something very important that we have kept coming back to but i think it's worth you know mentioning it again towards the end it's not about agreeing about everything you can still have deep-seated disagreements i said deep-seated disagreements but it censored it <laughs> And nonetheless, agree on the most important thing, which is our shared humanity. Um, Finn, you probably remember from the previous dialogue with Jeff and Arno and Dia that I tried to end on an optimistic note too. And both of them were quite optimistic about certain things they saw. What about you? If you are to sound an optimistic note on the possibility of human beings to fight polarization and conflict and actually be in fruitful dialogue, what would you say? I would use then uh, my working context. Uh, I'm a doctor uh, and work quite much with what we call dialogues, a very complicated word is psychotherapy. And we know that uh, through meetings, two persons in the same room for a time, uh, people can get cured from uh, mortal illnesses. That's very optimistic. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Is that a lovely place to stop? I, I should add that since we have a preeminent psychotherapist here and a sofa, I was originally planning for every one of the interviewees <laughs> to lie there. Wouldn't that have been fun? But it wouldn't take too much time because I would just get up one at a time. So this is much better. Um, I think, in line with what you've all said, that we want to end this meeting on a high note by thinking about how you and I, in our everyday lives, can realize some of these things. To some, of course, talking about these things also bring forth bad conscience and guilt because we haven't always been good enough. But let's try to reconcile with the things that we haven't managed to, because that's what Arno and Jeff have done. They have shown us that there is a way out on the other side. You can reconcile with the things that aren't good enough, and then move on and create something better, maybe even just with the person right next to you or a person you haven't talked to in a while, or in some cases, just by talking to yourself. That's exactly what I was just going to say is, you know, we've been speaking about dialogue today as if it's a group endeavor, 
the, the other dialogue that I think we underestimate that is really important to think about is the dialogue that we have with ourselves, our own inner story that we keep telling ourselves. And I think a huge part of an outer dialogue going well is once our inner dialogue allows us to accept ourselves and allows us to reconnect or connect to our own humanity. Just like Jeff, Jeff was saying earlier, he was only able to see my humanity once he started reconnecting back to himself. And that comes from what happens in here and what you tell yourself and your inner dialogue. So I think we cannot forget that most crucial part of how we talk to ourselves will then reflect in how we talk to everybody else and in the world. So. Isn't, isn't that why? Isn't that why it says "Love thy neighbor as thyself"? So you have to also be kind to yourself. And have a dialogue with yourself. I thought I'd do something elegant now by removing this microphone that I didn't use anyway and just leave it here. I forgot that the actual board uh, is on the inside of my jacket, so I'll look all silly while I say thank you. But maybe that helps in a way. It kind of takes away the tension. So on behalf of uh, everyone who has been part of doing this, and I know Chashti will come with a formal thanks, but I want to say thanks to everyone who has spoken up here, but not least to all of you for setting aside this afternoon to enter into dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Dia. You're a mega star, and you have enlightened us. You have moved us. You have touched our hearts. Our minds and um, I feel strongly that we can all be part of a positive change after this and thank you so much for bringing Arno and Jeff with you to learn from them to hear them and with deep respect understanding the journey that you two have been through has made I think I can speak for all of us an immense impression. So thank you so much to the three of you. Thank you to Henrik. It's always so wonderful to work with you. And thank you for the good dialogues that you have been able to facilitate. Thank you, Shru. And thank you, Finn, for also good advices and uh, deeply moving statements. And I also want to thank the wonderful staff at the World Peace Center for making this happening, and especially Kim, who saw him on stage here in the beginning. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, I also want to repeat Henrik's thanks to all of you coming here today. It makes me so grateful and thankful and hopeful. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Saturday evening in November, in the dark, light a light and think good thoughts.